We are really happy to have you here. My name is Slim Otman, and I will be your host for today. We'll be talking about state architecture with Dr. Sana Sayari. Moderating this talk will be Ishar Jamil. Dr. Uh, Rashid is an entrepreneur. He's the co-founder and the CEO of both Altec and Skyscraft. Altec is a software development firm that specializes in software web and app development, as well as VR and AR. Skystrack is a new construction management ERP software that maximizes project coordination and efficiency across construction projects. Ishad and his team have delivered projects for large corporations in VR and AR around architectural, industrial, and gaming. Uh, before we start, and for those who are joining us for the first time, Hop Talks are hosted by the Architects Hop Talk Hop Qatar, a non-profit architectural association uh, that's all about professional networking through knowledge sharing. You are all invited to share your thoughts and ask questions at the end of the talk. This session will be recorded, uh, will be uploaded uh, later on YouTube. Please keep your mics on mute throughout the presentation, but feel free to share your comments through the chat. After the presentation, the moderator will attend to your question. And uh, if, you want to, or if you want to speak directly, please raise your hand. Please keep your comments or questions short to the point and straight to the point to allow others to engage. Thank you for being here. And now I'll pass to Ishad. Ishad, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Slim, for that. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hub Talk today. Uh, with this evening, we have the esteemed speaker, Dr. Sama El Sayari. Sama El Sayari is an assistant professor of architecture, a researcher, and an award winning architect with a special passion for outer space architecture. He has over 40 awards and prizes in the last 20 years, as well as been on several TV interviews globally. His work is exhibited in several countries, including NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, MedCorp 21 France, United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, Paris, Greece, Tunisia, Egypt, Malaysia, amongst very other countries. Dr. Sama's work has been featured in Discovery Channel's UK's documentary, Dutch TV, California Dreamers Channel, Wired Magazine, Up Magazine, Alarca, many others, as well as websites such as Universe Today, Design Boom, Art Daily, Space Architect, and many more to go. So before I pass on uh, to Dr. Summer, a quick reminder that the presentation is gonna go on for another 40 or 45 minutes. I ask everyone to keep their microphones on mute and all questions will be answered at the end of the conversation. So without any further ado, Dr. Summer, please let us begin. Thank, thank you guys really for us hosting me today. It's my pleasure and I'm honored really to be among uh, you guys and trying to spread knowledge and raising awareness into some of the pressing issues and uh, it might be a little bit uh, new to some of you so let's just uh, start without any further ado uh, i would like to to start my presentation with a very uh, important quote that uh, you will relate uh, across all of the slides that will be presented today it's da vinci's quote the one he quoted that develop your senses especially learn how to see and the most important part is the coming one they realize that everything connects to everything else so what is our position what is our situation today on cardiff scale cardiff scale is a scale of measuring the degree of civilization and just to, to give you a good perspective uh, 200 years ago, we were just pushing wagons or maybe um, riding wagons pushed or pulled by, by horses. And today we have stealth fighters. And today we have space shuttles. We have the International Space Station for the orbit for the last, like, uh, the last 20 years. So that was not science fiction. But at, back at that time, 200 years ago, if you'd like to describe the kind of advancement and technology that we were living today, it was really like magic for them. It, it's something that is totally unbelievable. So our current situation or our status quo on Cardiff scale, we didn't really reach type one civilization, really. We are 0 0.73 of type one civilization. It is expected that we need like a couple of 200 years or maybe more or less just to reach the first scale. 
So can you imagine just in 200 years advanced in the future, what kind of technology that will be present? So why are we working in space architecture? There are many theories and there are many findings and there are many arguments and reasons, but just let's summarize them in, in the following uh, points. It might be a utopian vision or a dystopian scenario, but they are different, but where they all uh, share common things, that is it's important for us to think outside Earth, not outside the box. So the first theory or the first set of people, set of uh, scientists, they are calling for the extinction, preparing for the extinction level event or the mass annihilation or existential risks. They are all notions for the same concept. We have many, many reasons to think that life really could be ended easily on Earth. The Earth has survived maybe five different kind of extinctions in, in the past, and we are on the verge of the sixth one according to science and science. There are many reasons. Some of them are anthropogenic, which is man-made, fancy word for the word man-made, or non-anthropogenic, which is the natural causes. But 16 different causes, and the list is rising. One of the main key scientists that called upon this kind of the causes or arguments was Stephen Hawking, the passing away scientist. The passed away scientist. I don't think that the human race would survive the next thousand years. Unless we spread into space, there are too many accidents that can befall life on a single planet, but I'm optimist we will reach out to the stars. Switching from the dystopian scenario to a much more utopian future, also space will give us, give us new opportunities. Like Elon Musk, I want to make humans a multi-planetary species, a diversity in the culture, the diversity in the resources, a diverse kind of industries, a new life that might emerge everywhere. And that might lead to space economy. Even it might lead, according to some economists, economists to the 5IR, the fifth industrial revolution, which is based on the space economy. And we will talk when we talk about space economy, also we mean space medicine, a kind of new kind of medicine, zero gravity surgeries that will enable people to live longer. It will be a new kind a new era that will open a lot of doors for us. Can you imagine also the 3D bioprinting or a 3D printing on a molecular level when you just 3D print your whole corpse in the 25 year when you are in the best shape and then store it and reuse it when you're in the 70s or the 80s. New opportunities will be provided. And one of the key players and key game changers in this field was Jeff Bezos when he quoted that I, what I want to achieve with the Blue Origin, which is the company of, founded by Jeff Bezos, is to build the heavy lifting infrastructure that allows for the kind of dynamic entrepreneurial explosion of thousands of companies in space. And he just mentioned that Earth should be the green planet, the healthy green planet to live in, and every pollutant kind of industry should be out in the outer low Earth, low Earth orbit. And don't forget fun. Fun is important also, space tourism. And the space tourism, of course, the pioneer of the space tourism is the coolest entrepreneur in, in Silicon Valley, which is Richard Branson. By the way, he, is, he had that title, the coolest entrepreneur, when he founded Virgin Galactic. And then he already started his space tourism and he already uh, took a bunch of people to the zero gravity, experienced the zero gravity for like three and a half minutes. And it's a little bit expensive ticket, but it will be available for everyone just in a few years. So let's dig into the space architecture. We categorize space architecture into two main fields. Planetary architecture, which is a kind of architecture that will be floating in an orbit. So that means that you don't have any kind of resources. So that means that you have to build and integrate everything on Earth and then shoot it out to the space, which is called the pre-integrated class architecture. And on the other hand, we have another kind of architecture which is considered to be the orbital, sorry, the planetary and the orbital. I was uh, just talking about the orbital one, and now I'll be mentioning the planetary, which means that you will be building on a rock planet or any, any kind of rock celestial body. That means that you can use the resources of this planet in, in an ISRU concept, which is the in situ resource utilization. You can use the available resources, you can use the available frozen water or any kind of resources. And that kind of architecture is the most important for us. In the, in the time that we have already started our space architecture with the orbital architecture, we have the ISS, for example, we had before the Mir space station and the Skylab and many, among many others. But the planetary architecture is important for the economy. We can just import 
rare earth element for moon helium-3 which is very crucial and important as a fuel for the nuclear uh, reactors among many other opportunities that could be founded that is the status that is the current status of space architecture it's totally complicated and sophisticated and non-humane maybe non-architectural kind of space and it is kind of a technical space that maybe you 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 really feel uncomfortable you feel uh, like uh, with a claustrophobic effect you feel like just if you switch any kind of uh, button by error or snatched any kind of wire something might go wrong so there is a need to architects to step in all of the presented projects today are based on either existing technologies and or uh, future technologies which had passed already the first prototype so there is no science fiction of what will be presented today also please let me uh, remind you all of the presented projects were internationally awarded and reviewed and judged by space experts and our uh, astronauts what what are what am i doing i'm using a new kind of um, design methodology and let's begin with what is design design is a strategy from problem solving so we are solving problems for humanity problems for uh, occupying non-habitable spaces so the main approach is community-centered design and community-centered design it is a, a advanced uh, developed version of the human-centered design the human-centered design which takes the human in the center of the design and start with the empathy and ends with a prototyping and testing but in but uh, in community center design we take into consideration the social imperative which is the community we are we are a kind of creatures that live together and that is the reason that we have survived millions of years ago we can't really live live alone we need each other and the space the same applies in uh, new lands in space so it is a three step three steps manifesto first one is uh, digging deep in the old knowledge and science accumulated through thousands of years ago to capture the hidden values and the intangible strengths of our human legacy and uh, about that issue i would like also to mention or to remind you with a very important quote which is the the mother of all inventions was necessity and our ancestor thousands of years ago didn't invent something for the sake of fun they invented everything for the sake of necessity and i do believe that the beginnings are similar when we are shooting our astronauts with space we are uh, entering uh, a very harsh kind of environments which is much more likely like the kind of environments that that our ancestors faced thousands of years ago so they developed solutions to survive and we need those solutions but by developing that solution those solutions using our today's cutting edge technology we possess a kind of technology that was considered like black magic just 200 years ago so we have to redefine and rethink and start experimenting our old values using this kind of cutting edge technologies and of course the last part is the future would like to document those experiments to pass it and to pass our traditional system knowledge for the future generations and that i might record as the science sustainability or the sustainability of science the sustainability of knowledge like our old ancestors they have succeeded in documenting most of their heritage but most of this heritage was not really enough we needed more so we have also to document our kind of knowledge and experiments to pass it to our future so it is the three steps starting from the past to the present and shooting it to the future space settlement there is a debate should it be called space settlements or space colonies and of course colonies imply colonization was a depletion of resource depletion of resources so the 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 name was uh re changed several times until we reached the space settlements a place where you can settle a place that you can instead of uh, survive no you need to thrive the oasis the first source of life the first gathering around the source of water the flora and the fauna and then explored and discovered by men and then domesticating the animals and starting a small community which is turning infused into a settlement that rises in few decades into a civilization we are gathering around the source of water and the last discoveries from one decade ago maybe it's like from starting from 2009 2008 we have discovered huge massive resources on moon and on mars with a frozen water 
may be buried under just few meters from the lunar regolith. And that was the one of the most de promising discoveries of the 21st century. But also, we can't, uh, we can't deny, we can't forget nature. Nature was the mentor. Nature has uh, tutored us how to think in problem solving with the nature-based solutions, which are the most appropriate solutions, the most feasible solutions, and the most cost-effective solutions. And let's also borrow the quote of Le Corbusier, the father of the modern architecture, the founder even of the modern architecture, when he said, you know, it is always life that is right and the architect who is wrong. And also we have to take into our consideration, our psychology, our mindset. The circle, the circle was also always reflecting our uh, community, our uh, unity, uh, the tribe, the family, the nation, the country, the the everything. Even in, in our daily quotes, we use it when we say circle of friends, circle of family, circle of trust. So the circle is hardwired in our brains that it reflects the social imperative that we have to live in a community. In the ancient times, the tribe used to dance and even together at the cold nights around the fire to discuss the future of their tribe or their clan. And the same applies for today. So by gathering all of those figures and reasons, the project of the Lunar Oasis was born. The history of this project, it was, uh, it was an award-winning project three times. First time was in 2018 in Jack Rogeri Foundation in uh, Paris. And it was uh, judged by uh, astronauts and space scientists. And then later on in 2020, it was awarded again in uh, Ukraine-based space uh, competition, also judged by space uh, experts. And lately it was published as a scientific poster in the United Nations Office of Space Affairs in Vienna. And it's still online till we are speaking in this right moment. Also, I do believe in the ancient solution, the anthropization. Anthropization is a typical human behavior in trying to tame and trim nature, to apply to our needs and our functional needs. So the most important and the most obvious example was the anthropic uh, degradation of the hills and mountains to cultivate them and start farming process. So by gathering all of those human values and natural values, and also there is a commonality, there is something common. Also, one of the most important figures that was utilized inside and formalized into the design of the lunar oasis with the ant colonies, one of the most sophisticated kind of settlements and colonies that we have to learn from. There is ingenuity in this kind of uh, colonies. The ants store all of this food and the embryos and eggs, and uh, they face all kinds of existential risks for the ants, of course, and termites starting from the floods, from the storms, and they can survive the whole season without any damage. And uh, they are also thriving inside this uh, colony. So by deep science the, and by uh, reading and studying the ant colonize, colonies and all of the anthropization process and all of the philosophies, all of this was the fusion pot. It was all fused and melted in the one fusion pot, which resulted in project uh, oasis, lunar oasis. Also, uh, I define myself as a scientist, by the way, a scientist who reads science papers and use it to produce architecture. And after this poor architecture and entering with competitions, I turn it again into a scientific paper. So most of the program and most of the data that you can find illustrated and uh, quoted here is derived from uh, NASA papers. And precisely, I would like um, to quote or to mention, uh, to cite Marco Cohen, the NASA chief architect, that I used most of his findings and scientific research in building the lunar oasis. The cave, one of the first early kind of shelters that humanity have discovered and found to face the harsh environment conditions, starting from predators and passing to the uh, harsh environmental conditions and environmental parameters. And the same applies as I do believe that the, the beginnings are similar, but this time, Another research from Purdue University had founded the lunar lava caves and the approximate size of lunar lava caves and even they have 3D modeled an approximate shape of it. And on the left hand, you can find a section with Philadelphia 
uh, city just inside it. Due to the 16% gravity of the moon, which is uh, only 16% of the gravity of the Earth, the very low gravity, so the geological formations of such caves uh, has a massive height, a massive width, and huge dimensions, but it will be providing us with an ultimate shelter, with the best kind of shelters that will protect us from meteorites, from radiations, the gamma cosmic flares, or the sun flares even. All kind of harsh conditions that might end the life on the moon could be now shielded inside this cave. And I tried, after all of this uh, scientific findings, I tried to model my own lunar lava cave uh, based on those findings. And my selected site was Philolus Crater on the south moon, which it's believed that there is huge massive uh, reserves of frozen water out there. And you can, you can see that this is the first prototype lunar oasis uh, colony or settlement. And then the second one will proceed and then the third one and the fourth one to start a new kind of life and all connected with one urban spine or I might say inner urban spine. Also, the graphics or the documenting all of our uh, uh, history, starting from 1969. And here, really, it is very in, uh, interesting to mention the process which formalized all of this world mural that started from 1969 and ended in 2050. According to anthropology, there are four kind or four categories of uh, colonization. The first uh, category of colonization or the first phase when you just explore a new land and you go and stick your uh, flag and declare that this land is founded by nation X or nation Y. The second phase of colonization when immigrants start to pass or to, to, uh, to move to the new land and start exploring and uh, finding the new resources that could be provided uh, to sustain life on the new kind of uh, colony. The third phase is the permanent kind of colonization when they declare that this is the new home and we are disconnected from our motherland. And the fourth kind of civilization when they declare independence and usually it is associated with military conflicts. So we have already passed phase one in 1969 when Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong has already uh, set foot on, on moon. And now we are pre preparing for uh, the Artemis program that should be starting in 2000, 2024 or maybe 2025. And that would be the second phase of colonization. Most of my work is working on the third phase of colonization. And hopefully at the end, there might be someday a child born on moon. That is a very schematic uh, uh, overview of the inner spaces and the program, the architecture program that I was following without any further technical uh, complica uh, complicated details. And that was the section. And you can find here the reactor, the mobile kind of nuclear reactor that would be providing all uh, of the major needs of this colony with energy. At that time in 2018, I had a theory that uh, entitled me that there will be fusion kind of reactors but I think we might not really uh, follow the timeline, our discoveries, but I found another solutions in mobile nuclear reactors, the kind of nuclear reactor that could be found in the submarines, nuclear submarines, or even in the icebreakers. And later, there's a new project that was started by NASA in just like three years or two and a half years ago, uh, kilowatt power. And it is they are developing a new kind of uh, nuclear mobile reactors that could be providing the whole colony for energy for like 70 years, minimum. You can find also there are two safe houses, the one that could be brought from Earth and just inflated here, just in case that something bad happens. You can also, if, if we are really thinking about moving into Moon, that means that we also will be importing our problems on Moon. That includes any kind of contagious pathogen, pathogens, any kind of uh, viral uh, uh, illness, any kind of uh, conflicts maybe. So everything had really gone bad, there's two kind of safe houses that could be temporarily housing our astronauts or our crew members until we find out and solve the problem, including also any uh, burst uh, in the airtight construction. And moving to uh, powering solutions, we can't really rely on just one solution. So there's a diversity of solutions that all could be utilized together. First one was the in the construction phase kind of uh, 
powering system, deploying a set of uh, solar satellites in the uh, low uh, moon orbit, which will start beaming to the uh, selected side with a low microwave waves, the energy, which could be received by the antennas and start powering and start uh, deployed on the perimeter of the colony. And the second phase would be implanting the reactor in the middle or in the center of the colony to start melting the water and start the agriculture or the permaculture moon uh, to provide food. And then the last one after building the whole colony is the piezoelectric kind of flooring, which is important by the activity and the circulation and the movement of the crew members inside the colony. It will be also providing us with more energy. And this is also connected to our physical activity. It will encourage and motivate and incentivize, incentivize us to uh, uh, exert much more exercising and physical effort. We need, according to NASA, two and a half hours per day of physical activity just to face uh, the lack of gravity and the collateral damages that uh, happens to our bodies, including the low mass bone, um, maybe the weakness of the cardiovascular system. So the crew members will be having all of the physical activity, maybe dancing, maybe walking, maybe jogging, and at the same time generating energy for the colony. The formation process or the form finding process, including of course parametric design and generative design to reach the, the last solution, starting from the undulating surface of the ant colonies and the formation uh, of the circle, which, which, uh, the, which uh, visualize the, the tribe or the circle of trust, the circle of family, and having the opening for the ice water or the cold frozen water, also visualizing the Oasis, all of these uh, causes had resulted in the form. And last one is the contouring effect, just to enable the 3D printers to start building uh, in an easy way. Also, dividing the whole colony into eight different sectors. It will be operating from the first sector, and each sector will be independent of its uh, HVAC systems and all of the engineering systems, even including the food systems, just in case that something happened something bad really happened or any kind of uh, existential uh, risk happened in one of the sectors, it could be isolated and all of the colony will be functioning just well. The food production. The food production is one of the most important and crucial elements in any space colony. And according also to most of the space papers or scientific papers, we need four different kinds of categories. The first one is the nutrition plants, which is important for as food production hydroponic kind of system. And the other one is the medical and herbal plants, which will be used in producing the essential medicine for the crew members. The third kind is the biofuel and the kind of plants that having a high biomass or biofuel to produce us, uh, it could be used in producing energy. And the last one is cotton and bamboo maybe, and some of the plant systems that could be turned into gadgets. You can't really import everything from Earth, but you can make your furniture or even your gadgets on Moon, and you need that. Switching to the ISRU, it is the core construction key element in situ resource utilization. And by the way, it is something that is so novel since our existence on Earth. You know, in, in North Pole, they use the ice, which is the local building material. In desert communities, they use the sand and the mud, which is the available uh, community on mountains. People use stones and rocks because that is the available uh, building material. And we have realized it since 2015. And I mean by we, the ESA, European Space Agency, and NASA, of course, they have realized that this is the most feasible way in constructing a new kind of settlements on a new celestial body. We, can, we can't really import everything. The, uh, the cost of just one kilogram imported from Earth to Moon starts from 10,000 dollars up to twenty thousand dollars if it is a really uh, if it needs some kind of uh, preparation further transportation so it is very expensive and it's uh, unrealistic really to think in this manner we have to think like our ancestor thousands of years ago you have to use the local material which is the moon regolith and by the way we have learned this uh, principle from nature you can find it in nature in many forms let me just play this Quick video. You see this cute cancer starts building with the same type. 
it as if it is 3D printing using the regolith of of the mud and start building its own shelter. It, but can you see that all of the forms or most of the forms are circular shaped also? It is a very important lesson learned from nature. And turning to human activities, Shanghai Villa in Niger, in, in uh, Africa, and it is present till today. So it is a very successful solution even in today's architecture. When you don't have enough technology or enough money, you switch to the most uh, healthy solution and the same applies, but now we have also a new technology, new possibilities emerged. We have the 3D printing, and by the 3D printing, you can build forms that was not available or couldn't be built just a few years ago. There are new potentials. On Moon, we can use the regular or the normal kind of 3D printing that we use at Earth. We can use water as a bonding material in the contour crafting, so we have switched to another kind of 3D printing, which is called the laser centering. And later on, there is something also called the laser melting. It is uh, basically uh, applying a very high energy beam of laser to fuse uh, the granules or the particles of the lunar regolith and start building the walls. And the main key factor in the success of this kind of technology is having the obsidian or the silica, which will be fused inside the lunar regolith and both are available. What is the kind of wall? What is the kind of brick? What is the ideal kind of brick that could be used in the wall? After an extensive research, I found answers also in the minimal surfaces and specifically in the gyroid cube. The, the, the gyroid cube is a kind of uh, sophisticated geometry that couldn't be built, but, but only by using the 3D printing technology. And there is another interesting research uh, in my architectural work that I have found and uh, conducted by the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And they their findings have proved that the 3D printings of the gyroid cube is six more times uh, stronger than a solid cube. A solid cube, if you apply any kind of stresses or um, loads, it might have internal cracks that might result eventually in the breaking of the cube. But the, with the new gyroid cube, it resists much more better. And by the way, the minimal surface is something also derived from nature. But the new thing here, and the most interesting also that it has, it contains a lot of thermal pockets. So this kind of cube also will help us in the insulation, the thermal insulation due to the very low uh, degrees, uh, thermal degrees on, on the lunar surface or even on the Martian surface. So we also need an insulating kind of wall. So lightweight, um, conserves our energy, our uh, effort, and very simple in building, takes a little bit of a time, that's okay, but uh, at the same time, on the other hand, it is very uh, strong material, it gives us a thermal, uh, high thermal insulation properties, so that was the ideal solution. I started by designing the minimal surface, and there is a lot of mathematics behind the minimal surface, and even I have, uh, I had to purchase two 3D printers to start prototyping in, 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 in my uh, office and start building the first wall and then developing the, the idea and even covering it and covering the, some of the gaps just to enclose the porosity of the wall. And lastly, I had to also develop the kind of robotic system that uh, could be shipped on the moon. I found answers in the ABB. There are two um, important, the two famous companies on the whole world, the KUKA and the ABB robotic system. Most of my work was uh, concerned about the ABB robotics. Two categories, the excavator, which will be uh, responsible for gathering all of the lunar uh, regolith and filtering it. And then there's the laser sintering, which will be fusing and building uh, the walls. We have discussed already the colony powering system, so let's just like last thing in the uh, Oasis project, which is the hygiene and psychology, the mental well-being. It is very important. We are we are uh, human beings. We are not machines. We are not animals. the The balance between our physical well-being and the psychological well-being is important. One of the most Pressing issues in space architecture is the narrow spaces, uh, which results, of course, in a claustrophobic effect. Imagine yourself staying in your room just for a couple of hours, and how annoying that might be if you have stayed a couple of days. And then imagine it that you can you have to stay like a couple of months, and then just imagine the idea: can you really stay inside your room for a couple of years? It is it's really a depressing uh, idea. 
And on the other hand, imagine all of this uh, stays without a window, without a door. It's, it's really helped. So it's important really to have a clean zone. The, the idea of the clean zone is uh, the open courtyard. According to the, to the moon, of course, there, there is no atmosphere on moon, which means there is no wind. And uh, if there is no wind, that means that we could create a very uh, high uh, clean area, vacuum clean even. There is a problem, there is hazards in the lunar regolith. It is carcinogenic. It uh, sticks to our clothes and then um, moves to our uh, respiratory system, which might cause a very severe uh, health damage. So it is important for the people to start walking and stretch their legs and maybe experience the outer space inside the cave, the lunar lava cave, so they are shielded from radiation. But at the same time, they are as if they are walking in the park, park, of course, of the trees covered with the pneumatic structures. This is... Uh, 16% 16, 16 gravity, so it's a very low gravity environment. There is no oxygen, but they can move. They can just explore it a little bit. So there's an outdoor experience, even in the space architecture. Uh, thank God it was uh, awarded several times. And by the way, the project is not finished. The project, there is a long line, uh, line of research, and still it's a work in progress, even till today. Um, in 2019, I was contacted by one of the Gulf uh, governments, countries, and they were interested in building a simulator, a version of the lunar oasis, but in the desert of the Gulf uh, area, uh, to start experiencing and testing the lunar prototype. And at the same time, it will be considered the first uh, space tourism, but space tourism built on Earth. So I had to start researching and digging, and also there are a couple of uh, very interesting scientific papers by Cohen and Mockups um, about simulators. Simulators is very useful for the customer, which is the investor or the stakeholder that would like to pay for something, and he would like to see what he's paying, what he's paying for. The researcher who can conduct all kind of research, starting from the planting system to the human behavior inside the simulator, and last thing is the designer and the post evaluation process. And the post-assessment process, is it successful? Does it need tweaking? Does it need developing? So all of those parties will be benefited from such a simulator. So switching from the lunar version to the Gulf version. Of course, the Gulf version will be an open air. There is a lot of uh, different environmental parameters, but, we, uh, but I've uh, preserved all of the internal environment with the same idea, the same airlocks. If you would like to enter this colony, there is a very similar airlock. You have to, it's totally isolated from the outdoor, uh, thermally and in the uh, ventilation system. You have to stay for a couple of days and start uh, cultivating and start uh, working as an astronaut, but on Earth. These are just uh, very quick snapshots. And at that time, we didn't have the concept of the metaverse or the hybrid environment. Call it metaverse, omniverse, roboverse, what kind of any kind of uh, virtual verses. But we believe that the simulator on Earth will be the first stone or the stepping stone until we build the final version on Moon. And even it will be uh, both of the colonies, the twin colonies, will be connected with a satellite data package, data link. So people on Earth could meet. Their pair, uh, people on moon could be their parents, their beloved ones, their friends on Earth. So if you'd like to visit your son who is on moon, you can just step into the colony in the Gulf area and start as a metaverse kind of hybrid environment, start communicating and connecting. And in 2019, I started developing another version. So that was the third version. But the third version will be dedicated for Mars, the bigger endeavor. Uh, the main difference between the lunar uh, colony and the Martian colony that the lunar colony has three phases. The survivability, you have to make sure that it, they will be surviving, uh, which means that you have to think uh, first thing in the powering system and then in the cultivation and the farming uh, systems and last thing in the uh, architecture or the construction. So it's survivability, then sustainability, and the third phase is operational. On the Mars, on the other hand, there are only two phases, the autonomous construction phase, which will be conducted totally by robotics, and it means that everything will be built, and the last one is the operational phase, which is the uh, arrival of the human crude uh, members. Uh, thank God also it was awarded in Kuala Lumpur Architecture International Festival in 2019, just 
also by space experts and uh, uh, many architects. And it, uh, there was an exhibition in Malaysia. Uh, and of course, you can find that there is a unity within diversity relationship. There's something common with the lunar colony, but there are also a lot of differences. Now we have atmosphere. On the moon, we didn't have atmosphere. The gravity now on Mars is 38% of the gravity of the Earth. On moon, it was 16% only. Now you can find that there are four gates for the EVA uh, missions, and it, they are following the cardinal direction. So that is the Martian north and south and east and west which is very important landmarks for the navigation process for the spaceport and for the coming cruise and even for the navigation on the Martian surface itself. Also, you can find that now the trees can be gaining energy from the sun and there is a natural photosynthesis from the sun. But of course, don't be deceived by that. The sun on Martian surface is only 40% of the sun on Earth. But you can find that there are very long fins I, I'm not sure if you're following that, very long kind of geometry. This kind of geometry will be moving by the wind of the Martian surface. There is wind. And by the movement of this wind, it will be also generating energy. There is a different kind of problems on Mars. And at the same time, there should be a unique kind of solutions to face those problems. So this is a very quick comparison. On the left one is the lunar oasis. On the right one is the Martian oasis. And according to the uh, different environmental parameters, also the design was developed. Now, also learning from nature. It is something important, something unique, and something that is uh, I am following all over the phases, even if it is a different uh, environment. But now I'm uh, switching from the subterranean kind of architecture into the superstructures or the above ground kind of architecture. And also starting from the ant colonies and now to the termites colonies, which was considered to be the first kind of skyscrapers using the ISRU uh, principle. So these are mud skyscrapers built by termites, and there are very sophisticated kind of engineering in ventilation and in store, storing and in um, in, on, even in the architecture thing. And by that section on the left and much of the readings and studies start developing the kind of architecture that could be hybrid. Part of the uh, sleeping quarter or the living quarters will be dug inside the earth, but the other one will be also 3D printed above the earth. And you can find that there is a hierarchy starting from a long airlock with air showers to purify the uh, suits, the space suits, and even the EVAs or the vehicles will be docked and the movement will be direct from the pressurized EVA along to the airlock. And then the farming system and the most of the food labs and food kitchens and preparation food areas would be just below the trees to harness and to maintain and make uh, perform the uh, appropriate maintenance to our trees without the need to uh, get outside the colony. And then the operational quarters which will be most of the communication and uh, scientific labs, and on another safety measure, which is another uh, second layer of airlock for the living quarters. So it's a totally different approach uh, for the internal layout from the lunar uh, colony. Uh, I developed another de developed version of the laser center, which is called the lava casting procedure, also is developed for the Martian environment. It might be suiting uh, much more uh, for the Martian environment. And this research was derived from the ESA or the European Space Agency in collaboration with the Liquid Fire Systems Group. Uh, these guys are uh, really genius in, in developing construction solutions for the Martian environment. So uh, I'm architect. I'm not only science, I take science and make architecture out of science. So that was the evidence that I am working on a right basis and concrete solid foundation. The time oh, planning. Sorry, Dr. Summer, I just wanted to check with you on time. Oh, yeah. Just uh, for a couple of minutes, if uh, you'd be kind enough, and then uh, that might be the last slide. So the time planning, first from the selecting the appropriate crater, and then deploying the powering system, and then the boring uh, construction phase, and last thing is the 3D printing phase. And sorry for the time, I think I've uh, taken much more, but let me skip some of the uh, slides just quickly. One uh, particular invention with the Tree of Life, which was also awarded in 2017. Let me just, in Mars City Design Foundation. And it's about developing food solutions for Mars and uh, merging those solutions with the Martian oasis. 
that is the tree of life that was developed for Martian environment. And that was during the visit in Mojave Desert in California in 2017. That was the site for the first building of our first prototype after registering the patent. That is the virtual exhibition in UK for the project and raising awareness. And switching and aligning with the uh, UAE Emirates 2117 uh, Mars colony. So that is the solution, another solution developed for that endeavor uh, about building a, a micro ecosystem and uh, bio, uh, bio, um, bio life inside a life support system. Finding another ingenious solutions to solidify uh, instead of 3D printing, another research, and then the formation process. And another solutions for the orbital to be aligned and to serve all of those colonies space elevator which will be considered as the first railroad system to connect all of those colonies together the inside of the colony and gas station also to provide and to secure a traffic system between all of those three colonies together earth moon and mars deploying some of the satellite solution and powering system and even some of the self-balancing eva which i called the mars cycle it was also awarded in 2018 in hp mars challenge so i do believe that we have to develop and learn space technology not only for space but for our human race uh, thriving on earth thank you and uh, i'm sorry for taking a bit uh, longer than it was intended to Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Summer. Wow, like honestly, this was such a great presentation. And I really regret that we had to skip over so many amazing slides. I think we need another session with you to, uh, to cover those amazing subjects as well. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a few couple of questions that are coming in that I would like to address. The first being from Mr. Sib Sankar Palette. He asks if he if he ever uh, if he if ever we make different buildings or other structures on the land of other planets or celestial bodies like moon with less gravity, how can we tackle that less gravity to erect buildings on places like moon? Well, yeah, th this is a very interesting solution. Actually, we are used and uh, we are all right with uh, our gravity systems. And uh, while we are speaking, there is a lot of experiments that were already conducted in Germany and I've witnessed some of them, uh, which is building not only in a low gravity, uh, environment but also in a vacuum environment and the main pressing issue with the vacuum environment not uh, the gravity the gravity it's okay even there is a new potentials in building in the zero gravity or, or low gravities we need low gravities the, the hardest way is building in our current gravity but the problem that will be facing us uh, is the vacuum kind of 3d printing or construction so we uh, one of the most uh, prominent and promising construction techniques with the laser centering which later was developed into the laser melting and then the lava casting and there are solutions and yeah you can uh, if you'd like also to read i can provide you with a couple of links with some of nasa uh, scientific papers published for free even you can get familiar uh, with the construction things. I didn't invent, by the way, construction techniques. I just use what is available and the latest technological findings. And uh, I only invent uh, the new kind of experience on architecture. So, yeah. Great. Another question from LA. How do we, how do we counteract the need for natural daylight, especially taking into account the effects of reduced daylight in the northern countries such as Norway and Sweden? Yeah, that's a very, uh, thank you for that question, really. The latest finding during 2015 challenge that I also participated in, it, NASA required from us to um, take into our consideration what is known as the uh, circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm is our response to minimum 12 hour per day of the daylight system. And uh, to maintain our psychological uh, well-being and physical well-being, we need like 12 hours of darkness and 12 hours of changing intensity and color of light. Just uh, pretty much similar like the sun. So the first solution, if uh, we would like to consider for, for, uh, for an example, the building on moon inside a lunar lava cave, it's totally under darkness. 
if you would like to build on the lunar surface, not in, in a subterranean kind of construction, but a surface kind of construction, you have 14 days of darkness, total darkness, and 14 days of continuous daylight. This is the, the uh, lunar uh, month. So we are developing solutions, solutions like the LEDs. LEDs are the most prominent solution that we would like to use to compensate the lack or the continuous um, existence of light. And uh, you know something, just one year ago, uh, I have found that this kind of technology also was available now on Earth in the office uh, design environment. The new kind of lamp system was also uh, changeable uh, in the intensity and in the color just to mimic the, the circadian rhythm uh, derived from the sun. So that, that's the most the technology that we have reached. On, on Mars, on the other hand, it's a little bit different. Mars, the, the Martian day, which is called the Sol, is 23 hours, 58 seconds, which is almost like our Earth um, day. And it's uh, very uh, similar to our environmental day. So the real problem and challenge will be maybe in the moon and, of course, in the orbital kind of architecture. And I think this kind of solution could be developed to serve us on Earth in both the near uh, nations near to the North Pole or the South Pole even. Fantastic. One last question I think we can take in. Uh, an interesting one, actually. Do you think that bioengineering of humans is important to ensure the permanent settlement of humans in potential extreme conditions? Well, well, my friend, you are talking about a new kind of branch of medicine, which is called the space medicine, starting from re the, re the, the core of all problems that our bodies are not engineered for space. We are not engineered, you know, just in, in one month, in a zero gravity kind of a micro gravity experience we lose from 1.5 to 2.5 of our bone mass that means in just in one year you are losing about 20 percent of your bonus this is this is severe really you are being exposed in just six months of the cosmic radiation to what an irregular human being will be exposed on earth for 70 years so yeah there, there is a lot of problems which resulted in also in a new kind of thinking and a new kind of branch of science which called the space medicine the space medicine starts from building environments that could shield us till the bio 3d printing that could be printing parts of our bodies and when i say parts of our bodies i don't mean like bones or just for uh, plastic surgeries no what i mean is part of our vital organs which means that something like heart which contains numerous different kind of cells and muscles could be now uh, printed the the most promising uh, technology is the zero gravity 3d printing and i recommend you also to watch there's a couple of videos and uh, documentaries on youtube the, it's a new kind of um, industry biomedical industry but it is so promising and i do believe by advancing our technology in just few years and the nanotechnology merged with the 3D printing bio, 3D printing, or even reaching to a higher level. If we had progressed from Kardashev scale one of civilization to Kardashev scale two of civilization, we will be able to print on a molecular level. Can you imagine the possibilities of 3D printing on a molecular level? You can invent new materials by just changing the molecular structure. It is something beyond the nanotechnology even, but it will be available according to science in just a few years. So, yeah, it will save lives, as our modern me medicine has saved lives. So, Great. Brilliant. I think that's it for time. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Samer, for being here with us. I will pass on uh, to Slim right now to conclude. Uh, thank you, Dr. Samer. Uh, thanks, thanks uh, Irshad, uh, for... Uh, moderating the talk today. I want to thank also all the attendees for uh, joining us today. Stay tuned uh, with, uh, and do join us in the next uh, Hop Talk. We'll be, uh, and just check your uh, mails soon. We will send you all the, our agenda for the next, uh, let's say next uh, meetings. Uh, also uh, put in mind that uh, during this month, M Architecture, we have many events. Stay tuned. Uh, check your mails for our uh, for all our uh, future events. Uh, I think that's all for tonight. Thanks again for being with us. Thank you so much. And good night. Have a good night. Bye. You all. Thank you. Take care, everyone.